I'd like to thank any, all you parents for, for being here. I know that we still have some of our ninth grade parents that are, are, are making their way. <laughs> um, my name is Laura King, and I am the counselor for the class of 2018, so our current 10th graders. And I will be their counselor through graduation. So we'll, we'll be together for a couple years. A quick introduction I'd like to make is uh, our principal is here, Mr. Scott Myers. So I just wanted you all to be able to connect a, a name with a face if you haven't had the opportunity. And um, so first of all, what I just want to say as a fellow parent is I remember when my kids were young, babies, people would stop me and they'd say, oh, the days are long, and, but the years are fast. And as you are all on the cusp of planning for your students' uh, second half of high school, you maybe are surprised that you're already here. You're already talking about getting your student ready to be a, uh, an upperclassman. And it does go by quickly, but sometimes those days are indeed long. So um, I, I commend you as parents because it is tough work. It is heavy lifting and keep doing what you're doing. Maturity is a wonderful thing, and uh, it serves us all well, and it serves our students well. So, well, a couple things I'd like to talk about this evening. I definitely will cover the registration sheet, and that's the blue sheet that is in front of you. Half of the 10th grade class heard from me today. I'm meeting with their English classes, and we are going through their registration step by step. So I've already met with half of the 10th grade class tomorrow. I will meet with the second half of the 10th grade class. There's 381 10th graders. We are a big class. Uh, we will be kind of the bubble moving through the high school for the next uh, two and a half years. So, um, so I'm definitely gonna talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about some college and career information. Last year I was the 12th grade counselor, so I feel quite familiar with the college application process, financial aid, ACT, SAT testing. That's really still on the forefront of my mind. I'm going to talk about that with you, but I don't want to get you overly stressed. I'd like you to just sort of let this information wash over you, knowing you don't have to do anything about it. All you need to do is just listen, because in a year from now, when you do need to start doing something about it, it won't be brand new information. It will be something that, that you've heard before. And I don't think it's too soon to start thinking about those things right now. So I definitely want to touch on some college and career um, decisions and some financial aid concepts, just so that you have it in the back of your mind. Your students uh, that I met with today and will meet with tomorrow, they were each handed their transcript. And a transcript is a running report card. Basically, every semester that they take classes here, all at the end of the semester, those grades, they're locked in. And that, and that is their transcript will reflect all the credits that they have earned and it unfortunately also reflects some of those credits that they don't earn where the class is not a passing grade and that that can harm their GPA it will harm their GPA but the transcript reflects all those grades and that is what future colleges and future employers will want to see so I really stress with your students the importance of that transcript it shows their class rank how many credits they earned and their current GPA now, generally, as a ballpark, where we want our students right now to be, our current 10th graders, with one semester um, behind them and in the midst of that second semester, we would like them to be at approximately 18 credits earned. As long as they're in that wheelhouse, they are on track credit-wise. Some of our students have yet to take a study hall, so they maybe have earned already 21 credits. But, is, but 18 is really the number that we're looking for. To graduate from St. Louis Park High School, you need 46 credits in total. 
For every class that's taken and passed, that's the equivalent of one credit. Now some students and parents are under the impression that it's important that they take a full schedule every semester, meaning seven classes, no study halls, no open hours. And if they do that and they pass all their classes, they will have a total of 56 credits. That is technically 10 more than they need to graduate. Even if they took a single study hall every semester they were in this building and passed everything else, they graduate with 48 credits. Remember, 46 is the number that they need to graduate. And, and I'll walk you through exactly what those 46 credits need to look like. But one thing that we really want students to understand is that balance is important in their lives. And it, taking a study hall is definitely OK. Colleges are going to be looking at your course rigor, your GPA. That's what they want to see. So whether you have 56 credits or 48 credits, that's fairly irrelevant. Unless there's something that you're really passionate about and want to pursue, really the important thing is grade point average, taking classes that are of interest to you, and maintaining that rigor. So all of the 46 credits, the breakdown is this. Four full years of English is required to graduate from St. Louis Park High School. Same with social studies. You need four full years or eight credits. Math, you need three years, six credits. Science, six credits or three years. You need one credit of phi ed, one credit of health. They earn that health a quarter credit a year. It's embedded, um, but they will earn that one full health credit by the time they're done with their senior year. We need two fine arts. And then we now have our advisory, which is a way that we're disseminating college and career information. That's one credit. And then 13 elective credits. So that is the 46. That's the breakdown. Credit recovery. Yes? Advisory is embedded also. Advisory is embedded, yes. Thank you. Um, so credit recovery. If your student is shy of the, six, the 18 credits that we like to see them at right now, or if down the road they fall a bit behind, we have two options in which they can get caught up. We have summer school, which is approximately five weeks. It generally goes from mid-June to the end of July. Students can earn up to two credits through that program. We also have an after-school program called PLATO, P-L-A-T-O, PLATO. And that's online. Once they're 16, they can stay after school a couple days a week for two hours and uh, work at a self-paced online program in a computer lab. OK, so these blue sheets, I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes going over the registration options, subject by subject. So in 10th grade, students continue to have the opportunity to self-select, meaning <laughs> they choose what they want to take. And in English, primarily, we have three options. We have our 11th grade English 11, our core curriculum. That is one option. It's a full year class, so they would sign up for both semesters. Some of our students have chosen to attempt an IB class their junior year. If they are new to the IB program and you do not have to be an IB diploma candidate to be what's known as a course completer, somebody who takes a couple IB courses. And we really encourage students to do that. So we have our IB language and literature SL. That is um, one notch up, one tier up from the rigor of English 11. In that class, it's, a, it's very, there's, it's discussion based. There's a lot of creativity and imagination, imagination going on. For instance, they will read a book, and instead of writing maybe a paper about it, they may write a song in response to it or a letter. They'll do something that's a little different. There's still a lot of discussion and uh, analyzing and interpreting the, the material, but it's not the traditional way of delivering English <coughs> curriculum. If you're looking for that, old school, traditional way, then that's going to be more of the IB Literature HL class. A lot of reading, a lot of uh, term papers, research, analytical interpretation of the material. So IB HL is our most rigorous English curriculum for the 11th grade. IB SL is lighter, and then we have our 11th grade yeah. English. 
So those are the three options for English. In social studies, we also have three options. We have our US history, full year US history course. We have our AP US history, advanced placement, that's college level. Again, taught with a college uh, level textbook. The students take the AP test in the spring. And then we have our IB history HL course. And that is a two-year program where then they would take IBHL to their senior year. So that is a two-year um, IB program where they would then, at the end of their senior year, in the May of their senior year, take an IB test to see if they qualify for college credit at some schools. Not all universities will honor the IB um, test scores, but most do. It really depends on the school and how selective they are. With math, this year we, uh, well, for next year, we'll be starting a new math pathway slightly. We're slightly modifying what we're, what we're currently delivering. So what we have here, and you will see this, it's, it's, I'll walk you through it. It's a bit confusing, but I do believe I have it on right here. Here's my screen. It's, I think it's about three in. You'll see it across the sheet. So some of our 10th graders are in geometry right now. And if they're doing well by getting a B or above, then what they're encouraged by the math department to do is the following year take advanced algebra A and B. That's an entire year of advanced algebra. And by the end of the year, they will be ready to move on to pre-calc. That's if they're currently earning a B or above in their geometry. If they are not, then what is encouraged is that they would take advanced algebra A next year and then advanced algebra B their senior year. What we're finding is sometimes that advanced algebra is so comprehensive, there's so much material, that in order for our students to really grasp it and be prepared for college level math, some students really need, in fact, what our math department is saying is the majority of our students really need two years with that advanced algebra. So that is where they see the majority of our students who are currently in geometry where they're gonna go. But if your student has a really solid grasp of geometry, they're getting an A, a B plus, then it would be an advanced algebra A and B, and they would only spend one year in that advanced algebra. Now some of your students are already in advanced algebra, and if that's the case, they are getting the A and B right now. So then they will move on to pre-calculus, and there will be two phases of pre-calc. We have our pre-calc star, asterisk, and our pre-calc without. So the pre-calc star is for students who are struggling a bit with advanced algebra. They will be put in a smaller class where they'll get a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, move a little slower, but it is still truly pre-calc. If they're doing well in advanced algebra, again, we're talking B, A work, then they will just be in the regular pre-calc, no asterisks. If they're currently in pre-calc, then they're looking at AP stats or AP calc or IB math. They have three choices and their best bet is to talk to their math teacher to choose to help, you know, just to determine where they should be the following year. So that's our math. It gets a little complicated. When in doubt, just encourage your student to have a conversation with their math teacher. And then science. We have, what colleges are gonna wanna see is chemistry, and biology, definitely on that transcript. Some students are getting it, those classes by taking those courses at the IB level. Some are getting those, those courses by taking them at the standard grade level curriculum. Either way, it's college preparatory. So some of your students are currently in IB chemistry. So they are currently in IB chemistry SL semester two. They can stop at this point at the end of the year, or what we would encourage them to do is finish up with that third semester of IB chemistry next fall. If they choose to do that, they will have to double up on their science. 
by also taking um, a science that is biology, whether it's regular biology, but most likely it would be IB biology. Some of your students are currently in biology, they should take chemistry next year. Some of your students are currently in chemistry right now. They have a choice, they could take biology or IB biology. Question about science or anything? Yeah. I had a question on the IB chem. Uh, my daughter brought something home that essentially said that if they don't take that third semester of IB chem, it doesn't appear as an IB class on their transcript. That, so she, she brought something home saying if they didn't take the third semester of IB chemistry. That's what the, was from the teacher. Oh, okay, and, and what we would contend in the counseling office is that she did sit for two semesters of IB chemistry, so IB chemistry would remain on her transcript because that's the curriculum that she took. Now, I don't know if she intends on taking the IB test, that's another thing. Oftentimes colleges, if they know that a student has taken an IB course because it's represented on their transcript, they will want to see that IB test score as well. So some teachers will say, if you don't take the IB test, we will take the IB designation from the class. Rarely does that happen. Rarely does that happen. I've yet to see that happen. So, okay. so, I would say she took the class. She took the IB class. She did the IB work. The, the title stays. And that's what I would advocate on a student's behalf. Okay. And that was just not the message that came home from, from the teacher. I'm sorry? I mean, the teacher is the one who provided this. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> um, any other questions about? science or any of the other subjects that I just covered, yes. Um, so what about the physics part? Because I mean, my kids are taking chemistry and biology, but I mean, it's biology and chemistry, and they're taking physics 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 They do, they do, and physics is usually a class that shows up senior year. So a year from now, that's when I would encourage your student to take physics. Physics requires a lot of math, so it's helpful if students have, have achieved a fairly high level of math before they take physics. But if your student wants to take physics next year, that is an option. They'll just be with mostly seniors, which is their prerogative. Yeah. Well, what's the difference between intro to physics and physics? Yes, intro to physics is um, not as rigorous. It will have a smaller class size. There'll be more one-on-one um, -on -one assistance. It's a still a full year class, but some of the labs that they do, the reading material, um, the, the things that they're tested on will not be as challenging, as academic, as the regular physics. Yeah. So what is the three calendars without the asterisk? The slash IB, is that an IB class? Or? It is, and it's, it's an IBSL class. So it is not a, um, an IB class that they would take a test for but it does have IB curriculum tied to it, yeah. Is it recognized as an IB program? No, it's gonna show up on the transcript as pre-calculus. That's how it will be on the, on the transcript. But they, it's designated in that way so that families and students are aware that it is, it is rigorous, that it, there will be some college level material introduced at that level. That does, because that's a two-year program, and senior year, they will take the IB test. That's a two-year commitment, the IB English class. The pre-calc is just one year, and then they move on to AP or the IB math. Okay, so then on the back side of the sheet, that's where we get into electives. And students, I'm asking students to choose approximately six electives that they want to take. Um, language is not required here. Uh, foreign language is not required to graduate. But we do encourage our students to take at least two years of a language because that's what most of our four-year schools are going to want to see on an incoming 
freshman's transcript. They're, um, if they're looking at more selective schools, they're going to want to see upwards of four years of, of a language. But it is not required that our students take a language to graduate from this building. Oh, the other thing I just want to draw your attention to, you're going to see that double asterisk behind several classes. What those are, those are articulated classes. What, and what that means is that our school has an agreement with a variety of two-year institutions in the metro area, whether it's Normandale, Inver Hills, um, MCTC, Hennepin Technical College, where if students take these classes and they get an 80% or better, they will get credit from those institutions. The only hiccup with that is, is they actually, upon graduation, need to attend one of those institutions and take at least a class in order to recoup the class that's articulated. So, you know, in some cases it works out great. The student was planning on going to Normandale anyway, so it's just one more credit, one more, you know, three credit electives that they have. But in some cases, they don't, they don't ever get the, the articulated credit, but it still serves as an elective here. So our college prep options, I mentioned uh, IB, that's International Baccalaureate, AP, Advanced Placement, slightly different in how they deliver uh, their material. AP is really does uh, a broad sweeping uh, instruction where they cover a ton of material, and, but they don't go as in depth as IB. IB will take that same subject matter, say psychology, and really delve into a couple theories far deeper, whereas AP psychology would maybe cover 12 or 15 different theories. So it's a different style. Depending on the way your student likes to learn, one may be more appealing than the other. But we really encourage students to dabble in a couple AP or IB courses while they're high school students here. PSEO. The first week of March, we will be doing PSEO Information Center uh, sessions. This is one more way for students to earn college credit while they are currently in high school. PSEO is where high school students attend a college campus, the district pays for their tuition, the families cover transportation, and we have students that attend Normandale, again MCTC, if our students are earning about a 3.8 or 3.9 grade point average, they can get accepted into the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. Um, basically, if you're going to try to do PSEO as an 11th grader, you need to be really be hovering around a 3.5 grade point average. Once you're a senior and you've proven yourself a little more, then they will accept students who are at about a 3.0 for most two-year institutions you can uh, take PSEO classes as a senior. Um, some students choose to go full time, meaning they don't take classes here. They truly take all their classes at one of these institutions. Others choose to go part time where they'll take a couple classes here and a couple classes there. The challenge with that is that the calendars are not synced. They start before we start, their semester ends before ours does, and then their second semester will begin before ours does. So there's trying to fit that puzzle piece together. It's sort of like having two part-time jobs. You know, sometimes it works out great, but other times there, there can uh, be some scheduling issues. Our students sometimes are able to, to find a way around it. We have a lot of students doing PSEO, and they do it for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're really passionate about a class or a subject area that we don't offer. Uh, or maybe they've peaked out, they, they've gone through our curriculum in a certain area. Or maybe they just need a change of scenery. It could be a lot of different reasons why students choose to do PSEO. But I just want you to be aware that it is an option provided your student has the grades and the desire. The thing I will caution families about is once a student graduates from high school, they have that transcript. And that transcript will stick with them essentially until they get into college and they start a new transcript. And then that becomes the document that is with them, that college transcript, when it comes to employment down the road or getting into grad school. A student's college transcript is started when they take a PSEO class. 
and they're young sometimes. They're 16, 17, and they're treated like any other college student on that campus. They are not treated like a high school student. They are treated like a college student, which is different. And if they do not do well, if they get a D or if they fail a class, that is how their college transcript, the document that will follow them, is started. So it's, it's a big decision to do PSEO. And you will not, they won't have, you know, necessarily the support that they have here at the high school. However, a lot of our two-year institutions do a really great job with our PSEO students. And I like the program a lot. I just want to caution families that they know that they are truly on a college campus as a college student. Okay, academic sanity. We have a lot of kids who get really excited about the idea of taking <coughs> AP and IB classes. And they want to be that kid who has a full schedule of all those things. There's the desire to be something and the reality of who you are. And sometimes the kids get so caught up in that idea that they lose the reality of what it's gonna take. And I just really want students to challenge themselves but have balance in their lives. There are so many pressures on our kids right now with the needs to be involved in extracurriculars. I just read an article now, Harvard wants to see an uptick in commitment to community. That's gonna be big on their list right now. They wanna see their kids, their incoming freshmen, committed to their community and doing something that they're really passionate about outside of school. And I think that's great. Community involvement is a lovely thing. But our kids also have a ton of other things on their plate right now. And as parents, we need to recognize that this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. They're gonna be in school for a, a while and we do not want them to burn out in 10th grade or 11th grade. So sometimes we need to help them pull back. I feel like I'm just, where should I stand? Here? Okay. So um, I, just, I just want to mention that. The importance of mental health, balance, for, for not just their students, for, for everybody. So, um, so really encourage your kids to make decisions that are right for them to run their own race, not get caught up in what their friends are doing, but to do what's best for them. Does anybody have questions about that? Okay. And then there's the high school versus college requirements. I did mention this a little bit. The more selective the school that your student's applying to, uh, the more they're going to want from your kid. And so, you know, right here, the more selective schools, it's four years across the board. They want four years of English, social studies, science, math, language. They want it all. They want it all. Okay? And then a four year school, like a state college, they want to see the two years of a language. Our two year schools, they don't need to see the language. But it doesn't mean your student may not have to take language. They just don't need to take the language to get into the school. They may need to take a foreign language in order to get that associate's degree or diploma. <coughs> um, so the other thing is, is in addition to the credits that they earn, it's really important that they get out and do some job shadowing and join some clubs and some extracurriculars to bolster their resume so it's not just academics. Um, our course book, if you want to help your students make some decisions and you know they have already, they'll come home and say, ah, I took care of it or I'm taking care of it tomorrow. But if you want to look through what we have on our website, if you just go under student resources, you're gonna see our course book. It'll give you a description of every single class that we're offering next year. And if you and your student talk and you, they decide they want to rearrange what they registered for, next Thursday and Friday, I will be available in the same computer lab I joined them today in and we'll be meeting with them tomorrow and they can make changes it's not set in stone so they can modify if they've got it over for a week or maybe you go home today and you say would you sign up for, for math and they say this but i'm not sure they can talk to their math teacher over the next week come join me next uh next week in the computer lab and we can redo that if they want to make a change so it's, it we have something down but it can be modified next thursday or friday 
couple websites I'd just like to draw your attention to. We have two. We have our Naviance website that your students are going to be introduced to uh, later in the spring. That's where they can do a college match, financial aid, work on their resume, do some college and career exploration. There's a lot of great things, and, and families will be able to access this too um, with just a PowerSchool login. And the other one that I really like is our, our own St. Louis Park Sparks Online um, website. That is something that our college and career um, person, Kara Mueller, she's always updating that. There's stuff about internships, there's stuff about the DREAM Act, every grade level broken down, what should you be thinking about now, what should you be doing now. So it, that's a great website to check in on every once in a while. And junior year. So the, some of the things that are going to be coming down the line a year from now is your student's going to be taking the ACT or the SAT. In some cases, they take both. It's kind of a regional thing. Most of our students, the vast majority, do take the ACT. Um, they can be doing this summer, start doing a little ACT prep. I really don't recommend a student take that ACT before February or April of their junior year. That is what the test is geared for. That's when students have enough curriculum uh, exposure to do well on the test. So February and or April, that is a good time to be taking the ACT and or the SAT. Summer is a great time when students have a little bit more time to visit some college campuses, to do some job shadowing that can be so helpful, even if they leave and they feel like, hey, that's not the job for me. Well, now you know that's one to cross off the list. Maybe you visit a college campus and they say, I'm not feeling that college campus. That's really not for me. Okay, well, now you know that's off the list. That's a decision made. That's okay. Um, so, so doing some of those things, getting greater work experience, all good things to be thinking about for your student over the summer. And then the, the key things that colleges are going to be looking at. They're going to want to know about your students' grades. They're going to want to know how they did on their standardized tests class rank, extracurricular activities, and again, the community involvement. That's also becoming a big thing now. That's where some scholarships lie as well. I don't know. Stand back. Back up. Yep. That's good. Okay. okay. So now I want to talk about college. And this is, this is something that, again, I said it's, it's a bit out. But I think it's appropriate to have the conversation with your students. Some students are under the impression that if they get accepted into a college, that they should automatically go. And mom and dad should foot the bill because they got in. Well, there's a lot more to that. And I think it's really appropriate that you and your student start talking about, hey, I'm good for this, or, or you're on your own, or whatever it is, so, so that the ki your student doesn't have the rug pulled out from under them, and they really are aware of what is available to them. And because it's gonna get here before we, we know it. You know, fall of senior year, that's when they're applying. In fact, some schools, they're opening applications up in the summer before senior year now. They're trying to get their whole freshman class determined before school even starts uh, for your senior. So things are, do move quickly. So I just want to mention that college, the price of tuition continues to grow quickly and it's, it's a thing to be planning about and talking about. And there's ways as a Minnesotan that we're fortunate that we can cut some of that cost. And I just want to familiarize you with some of these options. Um, so first of all, student loan debt. I just want to make a mention of this, and this is why I bring it up, because I see my students decide to go to some colleges that cost a lot of money. And it's personal choice, but when they're 17 or 18 and they're making a decision that I know is going to saddle them with debt, that concerns me. And, and we're seeing it all the time now where Kids' lives are kind of on hold because they have a lot of debt and maybe they're struggling in the job market and they're, they're postponing a lot of decisions in their lives because they have all this student debt. 
So I just want to give you an example here. So Minnesota, they, we rank number five in the nation for student debt, and that's not a good statistic. That, our kids are get, graduating with a lot of debt right now. So on average, $30,000 is the undergraduate debt. And I just want to break down real quick. If a student pays the minimum of that, $200 a month, it's going to take them 17 years to pay that off. So they'll be, say they get done in four, four and a half years, they'll maybe five, that's kind of the going time right now. They'll be just about 40 when they've got this money paid off. And that's for an undergrad. Okay, now $200 a month, that's, that's the low number uh, to pay off a month. But I just wanted to point out how significant this is, some of this debt, and, and for kids to know this too, that this, is, this could haunt them for a while. So let's make some educated choices. And so there's the public and then there's private per year. Public average is about 22,000, and that's room and board. So that's gonna be your dorm, your food, your textbooks, the whole thing. Private, it's more, it's 43,000, but a lot of these private schools have big endowments, so you never know. Maybe they'll offer your, your student a really nice package. So I don't say shy away from the privates, but that initial sticker shock, that's a lot. That's a, that's a big difference. That's essentially double, but they may offer your students some money. Maybe they're a musician. Maybe they have really strong grades, merit scholarship, maybe an athletic scholarship. A lot, of, a lot of different ways to get money if your student qualifies. Community and technical schools. We are surrounded by tons of community and technical colleges. We have Normandale, we have Minnesota Community and Technical College, we have Hennepin Tech, we have Inver Hills. We have so many in being in the metro area. Most students take generals their first two years anyway. So they could take them at one of these institutions and then transfer to a four-year school. The price here is gonna be about 5,000 a year versus the price of other schools. And I just want you to know that most of our two-year schools, a lot of them in the area, they actually have dorms too. So some students say, I don't wanna to go to a two-year, I wanna live in the dorms, I want the college experience. Well, they say you wanna to go to uh, St. Cloud State, they have an agreement with St. Cloud Tech, that, which is a two-year school. You can live in the dorms, and then you can transfer to St. Cloud State your junior year. There's a lot of these agreements. So I just want your, you to be aware and your student to be aware. Say they want to go to UW-Eau Claire. Well, they can um, start at Chippewa, Chippewa Valley Tech. They have dorms. They have an agreement. And then your student junior year can transfer into the UW-Eau Claire. Just some ideas to, to navigate um, when we're trying to cut costs. This, I just want to point out, this is Normandale right now. These are all the four-year bachelor degrees that they offer. So while Normandale offers a lot of two-year associate's degrees and certifications, they also, by staying on Normandale's campus, students can get an undergrad, a four-year degree in any of these areas, and in fact, they can even get an MBA because Normandale has agreements with a variety of universities in Minnesota so that your student can attend Normandale's campus for about $5,500 a year and in four years walk out of there with one of these degrees. Something to think about. Reciprocity. Minnesota has reciprocity, which what that means is in-state tuition if your student goes to a school in Wisconsin, a, a public school in Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, and little known fact, Manitoba, Canada. There's an international university in Manitoba, University of Manitoba, that your student can get in-state uh, tuition for. So say University of North Dakota, just an example. If they, if they lived in North Dakota and they chose to go to the University of North Dakota, they'd pay $7,200 a year for tuition, just tuition. If they were out of state, say Wisconsin, Iowa, and they wanna to go to the University of North Dakota, they're paying almost 19,000. As a Minnesotan, because we have reciprocity, they're paying 8,700. So your student doesn't just have access to the Minnesota school system, 
They have North Dakota, South Dakota, and all the public universities and colleges in Wisconsin as well for in-state tuition. Just want you to be aware of that. One other program, just to put in the back of your mind, it's called the Minnesota Student Exchange Program. Now, this is bigger. Now we have um, Illinois, Kansas, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Wisconsin. All public state universities and colleges. If your student gets in, accepted to those, these schools, they are a minute, they're part of the Minis Midwest Student Exchange Program. So, for instance, University of Kansas. If they were living in Kansas, if they were a resident of Kansas and they went to the University of Kansas, for tuition they pay $9,000. If they are accepted as a Minnesotan for the Midwest Student Exchange Program, they pay one and a half tuition. So they pay $13,600. If they're out of state and they don't qualify for this, if they're coming from Colorado or California, they're paying $24,000, almost $25,000. So just one more layer to look at is the Midwest Student Exchange. That's another way to cut costs. And I just, the only reason I tell you this right now is just so you can have it in the back of your mind um, for your student. And then we have financial aid. And you're gonna hear these terms a bit. So I just wanna break them down just real quick and it's on the back of my packet that I gave you. But there's the federal Pell Grant. That's based on financial need. The Stafford subsidized loan, the Perkins loan, the unsubsidized loan, and then work study. To qualify for any of these, you must complete the FAFSA, and that's something you'll do the fall of your student's senior year. And I will help you with that. We'll have a financial aid night, so we will guide you through that when the time comes. But these different types of financial aid are things you need to know about. Federal Pell Grant, the most you can get from that right now is $5,700 a year. That is a grant, you do not pay that back. That is free money. The Stafford subsidized loan, that is a low interest loan that does not accrue interest while your student is in college. It does not accrue any interest, but once they graduate six months later, then it starts accruing interest and then it starts to come due. The Perkins loan does not accrue interest while your student is in college. Once they graduate, then it will. So the Stafford, if you have to take out a loan, Stafford and Perkins are gonna be the best bet. The Stafford unsubsidized, that is accruing interest while your student is in college. That is accruing interest. And then there's work study, which is getting a job on campus and getting paid working with a professor, there's a variety of things that students can do in work study. But they cannot even access work study unless the family does the FAFSA. So I say all these things to familiarize you with some of the concepts, not to overwhelm. I hope that's what I accomplished. I hope I didn't bore you with it. But I think it's important to know, I think it's important to be talking about it. And then just some resources at the back. Me, at the top here, Mr. Wilkes. He works with our GT programs. Uh, he serves as a counselor for a lot of our students as well. We have Jenny Magdell, who's our IB coordinator. She will work with you whether your student is a course completer, meaning they're taking just a couple IB courses, or they're going for the whole diploma. And then we have Kara Mueller who is our college and career coordinator, who, who uh, again maintains that Sparks online website. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I talked about this evening? Well, you have my contact. So don't hesitate to call or email me and uh, we'll get to know each other better because like I said, I'm gonna be with your student through senior year. Again, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.